Tim. Hello. Hey, Signode. How you doing, Brendan? Okay. I, I don't know if we're going to make it to quorum, to be perfectly honest with you. Yeah, I'm not sure if we will either. Mm, not looking good on the draw there. We can't make formal decisions, but we can banter about stuff that's in flight, right? Yep, for sure. Brandon, I can see your brain. <laughs> How you doing, Tim? Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Hey, everyone. Hey, Phil. So we technically have seven, so uh, we can do anything we want. Hearing things as in other people's voices? Yeah, I can hear other people say things. Are you not hearing anything, Brendan? I guess you wouldn't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I'm not hearing Brendan either. Okay. How about now? Yep, we yeah. know you. Okay. I think Zoom uses different, allows you to set different audio than the, it like overrides the system yeah. audio or something? It can. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Hey, Joe. Yeah, that's, I'm living that life too. My flight. When my flight landed two days ago, my ears refused to pop, so it was just like I was wearing permanent noise-canceling headphones that were ill-fitting and painful. That happened to me last year. That really sucks. Yeah. But for better or worse, I can hear you all now. All right, I think we should probably get started. Um, Tim, you want to start? So per the request from last time we met, I just did the PR to update and strip down the main charter document to just be like mission uh, and objectives. And uh, 
pushed it out. No. <laughs> you can hear me, but I can't hear you. We can hear you, Joe. Yeah, oh. we can hear you. I figured it out. I'm lame. Okay. So we pushed out the elections details into a separate elections doc. Uh, I know Derek reviewed it real quick because we said we were both going to work on it, but it's there for folks to comment on. If we want to split things up even more, feel free to comment and we'll get that done and just probably rubber stamp it now that it's a separate charter thing. Um, I'm sure we're probably going to churn more on docs as time progresses. Uh, I don't know if we want to do how we want to do PRs to the docs, but that's a separate topic. So. So the only um, issue on your PR, Tim, was I, I guess I could add a commit to your branch to add what the, I guess, the amendment to the charter process was going to be, which is why I think I commented on that doc to say maybe what language we had there previously should go in the initial charter doc. But otherwise, I was trying to look at what other communities do for amendments. I think we talked about lazy consensus. I think to summarize what I was going to put out was essentially um, – any amendments to the charter need to be posted at least, uh, I guess, uh, two weeks prior to a, a, a steering committee meeting. Um, and we would go lazy consensus unless someone objected and then you'd have a, a two thirds majority. If there's no objections to that. I will add that to uh, your branch, Tim. Go for it. Sounds good. So lazy consensus for amendment to the charter though. Are there things that we want to actually force sort of a real vote on versus lazy consensus? I guess lazy consensus usually meant that you had to give a time period. I felt like if you, if you said that no one objected within that time period we had defined, whether it's two weeks or yeah. four weeks, then like a single objection, whether you do that properly or not, should be able to call a vote. Um, that seems know. reasonable. Yeah. Yeah, I think the only concern we raised was like making sure that it didn't happen like on December 1st with a December or you know, January 1st. Day yeah, or so I think like four weeks was sufficient holiday coverage. And then honestly, if we don't have one steering committee meeting between the time and amendments posted and anyone saying maybe we should have a vote, like then obviously we don't have lazy consensus. So I honestly don't think we'll be amending this charter too frequently. So yeah, that sounds, that sounds reasonable. I also stripped it down. So it's, it's very focused by comparison to what it was before. So. All right, so sounds like just we need a review um, on that. And then we'll, we essentially are targeting merging that sometime in the next week or two. Yeah, I'll try to get a thing to Tim's PR this week and then I assume we can merge next week. Okay. Okay. Um, and then I uh, just wanted a reminder that when we met at KubeCon, um, we made a list of tasks and broke into small little uh, sub teams um, and the list is in the notes uh, for those that are following along in the notes, um, but it's also in the backlog.md file in our repo. All right, Aaron, you want to take the next uh, topic? Too many windows, can't find my thing. Um, this isn't like strictly related to the thing I have on my plate. So the thing I had on my plate was to review Brian's talk about um, assigning ownership of all the repos and whatnot to SIGs. And so to demonstrate good intent with the community, I've been doing a lot of chopping wood, carrying water stuff where I like disabled the wiki in the community repo and I revoked direct, uh, direct write access to the community repo. Um, I'm doing the same thing for the wiki and the Kubernetes repo. Uh, and starting to uh, ruffle feathers by suggesting that we remove direct right access to the Kubernetes Kubernetes repo. Um, this has raised a couple things. Oh, and the other thing was a uh, consistent code of conduct everywhere that the Kubernetes project lives or every repo that the Kubernetes project owns. 
So that set me down the path of begging the question of what are all of the repos that are part of the Kubernetes project? Um, there's an open issue in community, which I'll, uh, I at least found that before you called on me, um, to document the list of orgs that we own. Um, so I sort of found that after the fact, but I've been using that and then this issue here, which I just closed the meeting notes, that's great. I've been using my effort to had the same code of conduct file everywhere as sort of a tracer bullet to see like, is it every single repository in the Kubernetes project covered by this? And it made me think that for administrative purposes, it would be a lot easier or it might be a good signifier if the steering committee as a team was publicly listed as owners of each of these organizations within GitHub that are part of the Kubernetes project. So it's really clear who you can contact and that it is in fact part of the Kubernetes project. Um, this would also kind of uh, having admin access to all of the repos for the reasons I suggested in that uh, mailing list thread to steering would also help me a lot with um, pushing some of this administrative this trivia stuff through. Um, assuming I've built good faith within the community for all of this stuff, I plan on acting the same way to push through ownership of all of the repos by all of the SIGs. Um, so I haven't really made any substantive progress on the thing that I'm supposed to be doing for Ryan, um, but a bunch of other things on the side. Um, it sounded like I didn't get any real objections when I asked this stuff on the mailing list, so I'm just kind of curious what the next steps would be. So I, I think creating some list somewhere of here's all the organizations that are part of the Kubernetes project, making sure them some consistency that like, hey, for governance of this organization and all repos herein, go look at XYZ. I think that sounds super reasonable. Um, if anybody's going to have, you know, ownership across the project, having a, you know, a set of folks from the steering committee, you know, be owners on every single organization seems totally reasonable. Um, you know, oh, Tim, you're, you're muted. It helps. Um, when we say owners, are we talking about owners, the owner's file, or are we talking about owners, the GitHub permissions? GitHub permissions. Yeah, I'm saying GitHub permissions. The ability to add and remove people from the organization and the ability to create and delete repositories. From yes. So I think that's uncontroversial. The only question is, that is in my mind is like the mechanism that we want to use to do that. Clearly, I don't want to go and add whoever of the 13 uh, into the owners for every one of these repos. That doesn't make sense. So we want to create a group. Um, at some point, there was a proposal that all groups would actually be activated by a bot from some metadata files. I forget who signed up to do that, but it hasn't been it done. It was me and I didn't do it, so. I'll, that I'll. sounds like something we maybe ought to scope out as a chunk of work we could subcontract out to somebody from the CNCF using this mythical pool of money that they have. Um, it's something I think could be doable via uh, Prow within Test Infra just like point it at an organization and then have it automatically manage teams within that organization's based on some central repo that defines all the teams and usernames, blah, blah, blah. Exactly. You have to be people to do that, right? That seems great, um, but we don't have that yet. So uh, I guess the only intermediate step would be just to define a GitHub group that is steering committee and um, add that group as owners of every repo. So we have well, no, that, I mean, but that has to be cross org. Yeah, we oh, have sorry, as, as org admins. That's what we yeah, want. We have yeah. that team within the Kubernetes org, right? But we don't we would have to go and create that team for each or GitHub org that is considered part of the Kubernetes project. So yes. Step, step one, like define the list of organizations that are part of the Kubernetes project. There's an issue that I've linked in the meeting notes that's in the community repo where I've tried to link the ones I know about, the ones that don't not sure about, and then all of the ones that we may have preemptively registered. And I, I'm assuming this is something I pretty much just can't answer until Brian's back from vacation, but capture what that list is. And I'm using code of conduct PR to every single repo as a tracer bullet to make sure that there are people actually paying attention to those repos and nobody wildly objects saying, no, this isn't part of Kubernetes. So does it make sense 
so first of all, the list of orgs, I think right now is very small. There's a bunch that we've preemptively squatted on, but unless we're using them for something, let's not consider them to be part of the project. Um, like I, I make full commitment that the 20 or so that I'm squatting on uh, are free for, for us to use when and if we decide we want to use them. I just grabbed them when I could, right? Yeah. Um, but I don't think we should preemptively put rules in place because I don't want to go deal with those 20 orgs. Yeah, I think there are really only eight that are eight or nine that we eight? have right there. I'm not even surprised it's that many. I thought it would be like four. Kubernetes, Kubernetes Client, Kubernetes Helm, Kubernetes Incubator, Kubernetes CSI, Kubernetes UI, Kubernetes Graveyard, Kubernetes Retired. Okay, Isn't that so Kubernetes dashboard? Dashboard, dashboard? Kubernetes Dashboard. I have totally missed that I, one. Why are those separate orgs? Some of those don't seem like they should be orgs. Because org permissions are broken is the TLDR, right? Like we can't, I'm not trying to admit. Uh, let's yeah, no, it's fine. Um, great. Yeah. Graveyard should go away. The only thing that's stopping it from going away is Brian being back to give me permissions to finish moving all this stuff over. Yep. Yep. Um, other than that, okay, some of those feel weird to me, but um, fine. Um, I, what I can do in the very short term is at least for the couple of those that I have org admin access to, I can create, or any one of us, I guess, who has org admin can create a group <coughs> It has the 13 of us and add it as org admins. Again, I don't know if I can create a group as an org admin. I have to go look. If you can add me, I can take this on. And if I need to like scope out the work that I'm proposing to do, that's fine. I just, um, your call. I don't, I don't want to eat you up. I will, I will see what I can do. Okay. For, I, just, for the, just for the Kubernetes org. And if we establish that we're happy with this pattern, then we can do it for other orgs. Okay. The, the other controversial ask in my email that I guess we can talk about here was the idea about whether or not members, so we have a steering committee team in the Kubernetes org, and it's got admin access to three of the repos in the Kubernetes org. Should it have access, admin access to all of them? I think if it has org, if it has org uh, admin, shouldn't it have access to everything? I don't know if, I think you have to manually define each person in the team to have org admin. I don't think you can give a team org admin. No. So, so we need to have this idea of like a super org, right? And we need to have something that synchronizes across these things and we need tooling for that. Right, really, right. Like otherwise we're just. And I'm, I'm not, try, I just, I don't want us to necessarily get blocked behind that tooling. I'm just trying to document yeah. the state of the state and get enough minimal stuff. Um, together. So I'm happy to like help scope out the proposal for the tooling and, and how to do it going forward. I'm just trying to figure out what are the guidelines to follow right now. So I think, I mean, I think the tooling is the right uh, avenue in the end. In the short term, I'm looking at it right now. You're right. There isn't a way to make a group have org owner access. So I'm just going to click on everybody in the org who doesn't already have owner access and make them all org owners. Anybody disagree? Use it responsibly. Yes, with great power, blah, blah, blah. Don't push the monster. <laughs> Joe. Okay. I, don't, don't worry about me, man. I learned my lesson. <laughs> um, okay. I, uh, so you'll probably see more emails from me as I call out what I plan to do with these scissors that I will slowly walk with. Um, so, but I mean, but backing up a little bit. So like when I started looking at this, one of the things that got me a little wound up was like, I don't know Prow all that well. It was clear that it might, should be perhaps part of Prow. And I'm like, oh my God, like getting like Prow to the point where I can develop on it and start adding it and like play with it was kind of intimidating. Um, we need to get this tooling built. Is this something where we want to try and get somebody external to sign up to do it and actually pay monies for it? Because that yes. is something. Yeah, that's what I'm suggesting. I can help scope out. And I do think that, that ultimately should live within Prowl because I think it's, I don't think it's completely So all, all 13 members are now org owners for Kubernetes, Kubernetes, or for Kubernetes, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, we're all org owners for Kubernetes. Um, I think we should talk to Dan uh, and see if we can use his infinite money 
to hire a contractor to do this work. I don't think it's particularly complicated work. I think we can spec it reasonably well. Um, as this group, we, we can produce a specification that they can then code to. Yep. I'm happy to take that on as a direction. Okay. I'm not sure that I can get it done by our next meeting, but I can try. Um, but I think that the stuff I committed to for this sprint takes precedence. So, I'm, I'm now, now that I have this access, I have the ability to go and see who else is owners in the Kubernetes org. Do we want to pare that list down? Probably. Um, that was a separate thread, uh, wasn't it? Wasn't there a separate thread on that? If you start kicking people out, it's more likely you want to have rules in place to define why you're kicking them out. Just a thought. Uh, it's a different issue. We can take it up later, but yeah. Yeah. How do you see? Who, oh, here you go. Sort by role owners. I thought there was an email thread on pairing this list down. I was talking about pairing down the membership of the Kubernetes maintainers team. I don't know if that's what you're talking. Oh, about. that was the thread I was thinking about. You're right. Yeah. I mean, I'm looking at like I love Alex. Don't get me wrong, but like you know, he's yeah. not doing any. I agree. I, I agree. This list has a lot of people who aren't particularly active or who are on leave or who are, uh, Does I don't, to be well, I mean, they, they were there like a lot, like Daniel is there for hysterical reasons. Cause he was one of the first five people working on the project. Hysterical, historical, <laughs> hysterical reasons. <laughs> yeah. All right, that seems like a separable issue. Well, that's one of the other things is that as we start looking at the synchronization of like we want to have, we want to have YAML files that drive the team definitions. Do we want to have those then actually remove people who are not part of those YAML files? So have those be the only things that actually get driven by those? Yes. Yes. Okay, so that's a little terrifying, but I think the answer is yeah. I mean, I we're gonna have to rationalize on it because like we have two hundred and ninety-five teams. Dude, don't even get me started on that. <laughs> Well, I think you described it right. It, what we really want is a, is a description of a meta org and a bot that enforces it. Yes. So, um, yeah, I was going to say, I, I also think that Brendan's doc probably is the more substantive thing. I was really just asking for, give me permissions to go do stuff. I'll write up some proposals of next steps that I will take with those and make sure that I'm doing the right things at the right time and place. All right, you have your permissions. I'll um, I'll take the item to I'll write a note to Kubernetes Dev asking if there's objections to paring down that list and if there's people who are not on steering committee and are not robots who need access to that list, okay. who need that level of access. Okay. Well, I think I think like Caleb is doing some of the approval to actually add people as members yes. to the community. Needs right, so that's like a good reason for him to be on that list. So that's why I will write this note. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and then I hand the floor back to you to hand it off to whomever. And you're muted, so I'm just going to say, Brendan? That's, that's the end of the agenda. Uh, I, I, want, I want to add sure. Brendan to the agenda, because he sent that doc, and I think it's worthy of discussion, because it kind of outlines the key issue that we've been circling around for months. So, Sure. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't really have anything more to say other than the doc. I hope everybody's had a chance to read it. Um, the goals are basically to, so I think that one of the reasons we ran into trouble was that we were kind of trying to define an all or nothing process. Um, and I, so I tried to kind of identify three different sort of subgroupings of, of process that we could come up with in a sort of concentric circles of more, more seriousness or more alignment. And, and hopefully then we can find the right, for each project we can find the right blend that, that fits for them. So I don't know, any substantive discussions? So oh, I, I don't have the doc in front of me. Which doc are we talking about? This is the like three associated repos, sig repos and core repos. So like, one thing that really wasn't clear to me, Brendan, was are you proposing that associated repos can live in any org. Like I can go create github.com sock and foobar and call it a Kubernetes associated repo. Yes. What's the purpose of having the association at that point? 
Uh, there's a twofold purposes. One is that there was some, there's a fair amount of discussion when this came up in SIG architecture <laughs> about the fact that uh, ha having random CLAs or no CLA makes it harder for some companies to contribute, em employees of some country companies to contribute to uh, projects. And so by having a common CLA that everybody uses, it makes it easier for groups of people in the community to form up. Um, the other concern that was raised is effectively like if and when this thing becomes something we want to bring in, it's much, much harder to do it if it's not, if it hasn't been created under the CNCF CLA to start out with. Um, so it's kind of like a safe harbor, I guess, is the best way to come up with it. Um, it, it, it really is to sort of get, get people started with the patterns and practices, opt into the patterns and practices before they're really efficiently associated with Kubernetes beyond just sort of saying, hey, we're adopting these practices. So one question here, did we ever get an answer whether having a, having the CNCF use its bot to own a copyright of a repo, does that create any responsibilities on the CNCF? Are there any liabilities on the CNCF for having repos use the CNCF CLA? I thought that Ehor had asked and that they said no, but I don't remember for sure. And I don't think that it can't could possibly right like. So sorry, is there somebody else talking? Yeah. I was going to say, from an administrative perspective, it's a nightmare to support arbitrary organizations. Right now, the the current bot, you have to um, specifically ask somebody as a human to add each individual org. Um, for our own automation that we have control over, it's still going to be. Um, an entry for each organization slash repo. Um, and then you'll have to make sure that the bot has the appropriate admin access to said repo to do the things it needs to do. You, um, you don't necessarily have to do it that way. I mean, I mean, obviously I'm talking about discussing changes, but um, if the bot instead looks at repos that it is an owner of, and then goes and, or it is a, you know, is a collaborating member of and uses that as the authoritative list, then that ensures both permissions and lists in one fell swoop. And then people actually effectively only have to add the bot themselves without any human input. It's so this is kind of more of an issue of like how each repo is configured, what plugins are turned on for which repo and not since they're a little more bespoke. So it's a lot easier for us from an administrative perspective if we say all repos within a given org all follow the same set up or configuration. Can, can, we, can we table this whole discussion, I think, right now? Because I feel like this is in the technical details of the, okay. uh, in the weeds of the proposal. I'm and not, so like, like if we can, I, I am highly confident that we can make it work for associated repos if we believe that it is the right structure. And so let's not fight about the technical bits. Let's see if the structure is right. So my, my, my straw man proposal would be, would you consider the Microsoft slash draft um, is that an associated repo? Well, is it an, uh, if we decide we want it to be? I, I think that's the whole point. Is it's up to the project to decide if it wants to be associated. It's opting. It's an op associated is an opt in step basically, right? Because I think one of the things, one of the one of the rocks that we fell against, or one of the big reasons we've stalled for so long, is because we've been like, well, what is the endorsement? Like, what does it mean to be a Kubernetes endorsed project? And I think that that's all because we were talking about Kubernetes adopting repos, as opposed to repos saying, hey, I want to be part of this thing. And then there is no implied endorsement. We don't have to worry about that whole thing for that level of repo. And yet we get a lot of the, the regularization, that it, which is what we want, which, is, which helps enable collaboration, right? So that's sort of, that's the distinction between a SIG level repo and an associated repo is one is opt in and the other is, uh, it's not opt out, but whatever the opposite of that would be. Like, I mean, the, alternative, the, the obvious alternative is just to produce that playground org where you just say, anybody who wants a repo can create a repo, good luck picking names, right? Right, and, and I guess the, the, I, the reason that we didn't do that is I guess the general consensus was, well, the last time we did this, it was a bad idea. Right. Doesn't I, there need to be this like- is, That was what contrib was, and it, everybody sort of said that it was a bad idea. Shouldn't be, there be some hurdle, like our barrier to entry, like some vote of some kind to enable it? Why? Also, um, just because you're enabling CLAs, but that, it's, your, it's your repo that you own. 
Yeah. Why should it matter? Is it a revocable thing though? If I've given, if sure. I like, I mean, yeah, if you, if you go no, put this thing on. on like, you know, something, you know, my evil site dot malware.com. I mean, sure. Yeah. If we I, can have some, we can have some TOS or whatever. Right. If I decide I want my org to be associated, I put the CLA on and I collect a whole bunch of contributions to the CLA and then I turn the CLA bot off. Have I actually revoked the legal right for CNCF to distribute those changes? I don't think so, right? Because the CLA says that you've donated no, clearly, copyright clearly to them. Um, I'm saying that putting this in the end user's control is suspect. Uh, well, but I mean, I don't. I just don't think it matters, right? Like, I mean, really? Like, do you, I mean, either it's so unimportant that who the hell cares whether they try and do something like this, or it's important and someone will notice and will, you know, pursue legal alternatives or do whatever, right? Like. Uh, like, yeah, you know no, I, 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 I think it's pro you're probably right, uh, but I think there's an even more interesting case, which is some of the, I guess, of the CNCF projects, there's only two that use the CLA. Everybody else is doing DCO or something like that. Yeah, um, and that was a different discussion. Like, and I'm, I'm, I'm okay with DCO too. Like, I'm not hung up on the CLA. What I'm trying to provide is a consistent user experience. A, associated is really about trying to provide a consistent user experience. I don't I think the specific details are man. I think we need to figure out the DCO thing. Um, apparently there is some concern from Google's lawyers and maybe others that DCO wasn't satisfying enough. Um, I've asked Google, our, our legal team for clarity on what their position is on that. I'm not sure that they get to dictate what CNCF or what Kubernetes does at this point. Um, but I think it's interesting. Um, and if we switch to DCO, then we wouldn't need to deal with the CLA bot at all, right? Sure. And, and that's, that's, again, I think that's the technical side of it. Like I want to see, and I'm going to call, you know, yeah. call oh. and sick beard. Um, yeah. So like, I, I didn't mean to distract things with the CLA thing. I, uh, so my, my hang up is just that even though you're using the word associated to me, I still think it implies that we are taking this repo and we are now putting it under the Kubernetes project umbrella. Thus the code yeah. in that repo becomes no. part of the no. Kubernetes project. But that's not what we're doing, right? That's explicitly what it's not doing. Yeah, help, it, help me understand how, because to my, to my understanding, we are saying that it needs to follow our CLA and it needs to follow our code of conduct, et cetera, et cetera. No, it's, imagine, imagine that it's best practices, right? If you write a best practices doc and somebody then goes and follows your best practices doc, are you adopting their project? No, they're following okay. your best practices. We're enabling people to follow our best practices in ways that make it easier for them to come further in and it enables it, our community to contribute there more easily. My, my understanding is you were saying that's sort of the thing that comes up once we get to the SIG repo issue where you're starting to define a common set of processes and tools that we use for all of our repos, so things like well, the CLA, like, CLA of code, yeah, CLA of code. On. The thing like SIG labels and the consistent set of priorities everywhere, slash LGTM, slash approve, our merge automation, all of that stuff, where you kind of would consistently expect every repo that's core to our project or managed by our project to operate sort of the same way. But my understanding was associated repos are people just experimenting and they don't have time for all that heavyweight crap, but they still need vendor neutral places with legal protection to experiment and play around. So I'm trying to understand. Well, and, and, no, I think it's more than that, right? It's, it's like, it's, it makes the collaboration easier. So for example, I think that CLA or whatever we use for copyright and code of conduct, I think those two things are required because that's what it means to be compliant. Like that, you know, we, if, if, if imagine, I mean, imagine that someone created some horribly toxic non code of conduct compliant repo. We're not going to bring that into the Kubernetes org. Right. So like what I, what I want to establish with associated projects is effectively the structures that are necessary for the community to collaborate in a way that is consistent with our community, not logistically, not, not about the tooling, but in a way that is consistent to the community and also ensures that the glide path in to a more, a closer relationship is possible and feasible. Right. And, and, and I, I'm going to come back and like, I, this is, we, we can like noodle about this forever if we really want to and bike shit about this for forever if we really want to. But there's a pressure gradient here of very real projects that want an answer to this. And we have had exactly zero progress in, in making this thing work, right? And I think this is the closest thing we've come to to something that, that we can actually start thinking about implementing and would release the pressure wave, right? 
unless we want to do onesie twosie like with Dawn's thing and say like, okay, well that's a no brainer, let's go, right? Which I mean, I guess is an okay option, but like, I guess I want, I would, I, I, I'm in sort of more of a like put up or shut up kind of mood rather than a uh, like, let's, let's noodle on the details kind of mood. I guess I'm still really hung up on what the benefit would be of allowing arbitrary repos and arbitrary orgs versus just giving one catch all org. Because the, 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 well, I mean, I don't care if that one way or the other. I think that the value of it is actually the one catch all org is actually a stronger endorsement, but I don't super care. If we want to say associated as playground, but, but I think the trouble is then we have to establish the logistics of how do you join and what's the committee that decides how you join and what meeting do you have to go to and blah, 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 right? There will be a ton more of mechanism involved in, in a, a playground repo. Um, not saying it can't be done, not saying it's not worthwhile, but like, why? What value does it provide? I guess I would posit that the administrivia necessary to add yourself to the CLA setup wouldn't necessarily be that much more or different than the administrivia to have an arbitrary repo created in an org. I posit that the, that the administration necessary to add yourself to the CLA bot would be to add the CLA bot as an owner of your, of your organization or of your project, which is something that you can do using your GitHub permissions with zero input from anybody else. In the bright, shiny future, not today. No, right now, right now. I mean, assuming that the bot could do it. Like, I mean, the GitHub permissions are such that you could do it right now. I do think there does need to be some level of enforcement and auditing, right? Like there, there needs to be like, as Tim mentioned, you know, if it's like my malware dot whatever, there needs to be some way for us to check and vet to ensure that, you know, anything associated with this larger project is you know at least on the relative up and up, right? Yeah, I, I don't think there's a problem with that. I mean, but if you think about this in terms of like the terms of service for our logo, like people could be taking our logo and like putting all kinds of crap on it, printing stickers and distributing them at conferences. And like, yeah, we'll find out about it if it's big enough and we'll go try and knock it down if it is, but nothing that we do actually stops that kind of stuff, right? So, so I, I think that, I, yeah, I don't disagree, but I just think- It's not a great example that, because legal is arguing with me against that, so. Is arguing against you against against which the logo licensing that they want to restrict it yes uh, yeah. cncf legal yes yeah interesting i mean no, i understand no, so, so i understand that but anyway if we so i think i i like the idea that that brendan's coming up with that we have some class of repos which are there's no endorsement, right? I, you know, he called them associated repos. I'm thinking like maybe collab repos because collab has this meaning of like no sure. guarantees, right? Um, the, the CLA versus DCO versus mechanics is setting that up, set that aside. Let's assume that somehow there's sort of a, a meet me on the, on the copyright stuff that we could figure out as part of this. Another thing that we could do is we could have something as simple as like somewhere on kubernetes.io a list of collab repos with pointers to these things. And you, if you're a member of the community, you can sponsor it by just opening a PR. And if we find that somebody is like, you know, you know, spewing hates and not conforming to the code of conduct, then we remove them from that page and they're no longer a collab repo. Yeah, I think that's totally legit too. I think that's totally fine. So it becomes kind of a, like an official sort of Kubernetes awesome or whatever, or awesome Kubernetes. I mean, it's, to, be, to be clear, I'm, I was in fa I'm in favor of Brendan you scoping down this proposal to just trying to solve a discrete problem. And I hear there is an urgent need. I guess I thought the urgent need was more for repos that were going to be created in Kubernetes, Kubernetes, but we're going to empower them to follow the core repo standard. That seems to be commercial <coughs> to me. And the only other massive open question to me is whether or not each SIG should get its own organization or not. I think the, the concern was around effectively incubator graduation and, and implied endorsement and stuff like that, right? Well, like, I, I, I really like the idea of having SIG related repos, at even having multiple targets within that repo, because right now that means that the SIG ownership for graduation is well defined, right? Because right now we have many repos, who owns what, where, and how does it get graduated? At least you can go to a single clearinghouse for understanding what is owned there and how you graduate that or if it's a single sig org or single sig repo 
single sig org. Org. But I, I, to my point on the email, I, I'm worried that sticking things in sig orgs produces weird artificial boundaries that wouldn't be needed for collaborative. Like, hey, am I, I'm not a member of sig foobar. Am I allowed to send patches to sig foobar? So like, I just, it feels yeah. weird for anything I, other than sig specific work. I think it's like, more a question of sponsorship, right? It's like, it's like, who are the people? Like, I think that the, part of the goals in having the SIG orgs was effectively to be able to have orgs that didn't have to go through SIG architecture to create new repos. And that, to break that log jam, basically. Right? And I'm, I'm totally fine with that. Like, it seems completely reasonable for SIG architecture, or not SIG architecture, SIG scale to want to produce tools and things that live in SIG scalability. Awesome. I would not right. want to move cube proxy off into SIG networking. No, that makes sense. No, I mean, that's what I said, and in, in in, in maybe in, we agree you, know, to it, you went through it. But, like, um, I think that we should make sure that, that you can't graduate things, generally can't graduate things to GA without moving them into the core org, right? Which would mean that if you had developed Cube Proxy V2 or whatever in SIG networking, you couldn't make it part of a shipping release until you, or a GA, you couldn't GA it as part of a release until you moved it into the Kubernetes org. And I think that will hopefully accomplish what you're talking about. I'm fine with that. Yeah. So, okay, so if I'm reading this doc right, the primary, the primary thing that you're optimizing for is just level of endorsement, really. Effectively, because I felt like that was the biggest log jam. Because then, and, and the details of what each endorsement level means, I'm totally open to refining, right? Like, I, I think that it's the levels of endorsement that is the biggest log jam that prevented us from making progress here. Um, and was the biggest thing that separated, like, hey, three people from the community want to collaborate projects from, hey, SIG scale needs a bunch of tests, testing tools, versus, like, hey, this is something that's actually, like, API machinery that we know is essential and part of our main project. Or like, you know, rescheduler type stuff or whatever, yeah. Yeah, exactly. And I think rescheduler would be a great example of something that I would think would start in SIG scheduling, but what, what when it hit beta or GA would be the time you'd go to SIG architecture and say, hey, we're going to move this repo from SIG scheduling into the Kubernetes org. Because it's 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 now working enough and we have enough momentum and it's obviously the, the right way. Okay. Yeah, and I think yeah, exactly. It's like it's gone from being a prototype where the SIG is collaborating to being a core piece that the SIG still owns, right? But but And there's no expectation that things are like moved between these things on a timeline, right? Right. It, I thought that the GA someone mentioned timeline, but I think that the GA ness of it was sort of the more salient point. Um you know, I mean, it's moving orgs, as you described, or maybe I'm misunderstanding it, kind of making adoption of that repo potentially difficult. Like if all of your wide imports have to be updated or like, are we all using vanity URLs? Like, I mean, well, I would think, yeah, let's, let's, I mean, I think maybe you would, I don't know. I was thinking a lot about binaries. I think, I think there is a difference. I think there's a difference between binaries and libraries for sure. And so, uh, yeah, so we might need, that might be a detail that we would need to work out. I could see that being challenging. Um, although we've repackaged things before, right? I mean, we've re repackaged API machinery and a bunch of other, I mean, I know it was painful, but. Yeah, I'm just thinking of the, the, the scheduler component in particular, because that's probably something that like at Red Hat will ship and we might ship it as a sign of community involvement or integration. And then to have something get disruptive about it being moved would be probably that community. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess I would I would think that there would be a transition anyway. Like, you wouldn't start out with a vanity URL, but my suspicion is by the time you get to be a GA product, maybe you do want to have a vanity URL. I, I don't know. I mean, I don't think that we can introduce, maybe we can disassociate vanity URLs in GitHub organizations. So you could always be k8s.org slash rescheduler, even if you were in the SIG scheduling SIG. Okay. Like that. As long as we note that it could be an issue. All right, can you add a comment just so I remember to, remember to yeah. put something in there about that? Thanks. Uh, I'm going to call it Sig Beard since he's had his, had his. Thank you. So I just want to straw man what, let's say we decide, you know what, this more or less looks good, what implementation would look like. So let me just, for simplicity, say associated repos, let's just say that's everything inside of Kubernetes Incubator. Let's rename Kubernetes Incubator, Kubernetes Playground. Boom, that's our list of associated repos. We go and create. Uh, Kubernetes, GitHub organizations for all of the SIGs. Next step is we say SIGs who want to take ownership of things, please move these repos out of Playground into your organization. 
Um, the remaining pressure point I, or pain points I've heard are repos such as Kube spray, which felt like they have gone through the incubation requirements to go GA. What would we tell them? Like I, I think could, tell them go. They have to move to a SIG. I would tell everybody they have to move to a SIG. They would move to a cluster lifecycle, and then we would say, if you want to graduate from cluster lifecycle to core, what are the SIG, SIG architecture? You have to go through SIG architecture through a set of a review yet to be defined, but talk to SIG architecture about that. Right. If well, and they I want think to, if they want to be associated with the SIG, because that's that right. If they want to be associated, the of, yeah, that implies the notion of you want to graduate to the core and some. Some, you might have the conversation earlier on to say it makes a lot more sense for XYZ to be an associated. Right, and I think that that was kind of also the pressure, the, the forcing fu function, which is I really want to force, I don't want people to join or to want to join the core or just as an endorsement. I think it has yeah, so to. So like Cube Spray, I don't think ever needs to move to the core. Right, I would agree, I would agree with that, right? I agree, right. I was just trying to run through the, the But I think you're right, no, you're right to run through like <coughs> the people who will ask questions and I think the question, I think yeah. the question, I'm, I wouldn't even create Cube Playground. I would say incubator stays as is because we don't want to screw people up. Incubator stays as is. If you thought that you were ready for graduation, your job now is to find a SIG to own you and you'll move into a SIG org. If you want to start a new project, Go start an associated project or find a SIG to own you, your choice of bureaucracy versus freedom. Um, and then we're done. Should there be a time horizon for, I mean, like part of this is gonna be policy and, and policy enforcement. So we'd have to give like some sunsetting time period, six months or something like that to say like, you know, <laughs> you don't have to go home, but you can't stay here, right? You mean for incubator? Yeah, we could do that. I mean, I suppose so. I don't see a lot of harm in leaving things in there as long as it's understood and we put a label on it that says, that says like, hey, we're done. You know, like we're not adding anything new. There's no progress happening here. Things that, like. I guess I personally don't see a problem with keeping incubator around as a place where people can create repos if they want. It just doesn't imply you are now set on a path to go in the core. It says, hey. I don't think they should, anything new should be added at all. David. Yeah, I'm down with that too, I agree. Okay. I agree with Tim. I agree with Tim. People want new projects. They should go make them on their own, go through the associated route by getting adopted by CLA and whatnot, and then they should go petition a SIG after they've made some progress. Or they can go straight into SIG if they're if it comes out of a SIG, right? Like if a SIG are the people who want to. If it's a, I think I think it's important to differentiate between the origin story, right? Okay. One so origin. That, go ahead. One uh, one user complaint there. Yeah. I forget if it was maybe. Signode was talking about maybe it was Cryo or something where um, how, how can you differentiate the sort of level of maturity or stability or readiness? So let's say it's something that the SIG has worked on for a year, but it's something that's never really going to get to core. But the SIG's like, don't worry, this is totally stable and cool. How would a user be able to differentiate between that and a bunch of other experiments happening within the SIG's thing, right? I don't know if that's solving all the world's problems, but that was a complaint I yeah. heard. I think that they shouldn't. I mean, I think that what we, I think that what, one of the things to say is like, you can't graduate to GA from a SIG org, except for under special circumstances, no, like, I, I hey, your SIG test and it's prow. So I, I think the example, uh, Aaron, there was not a SIG node example. I think it was one I offered around service catalog itself. And that like, there is a SIG service catalog and the only output of that SIG is an incubator project today. Um, so I, I guess, and the, and the concern there was the incubator label made it feel less GA to some people for some reason. Um, I, I think in this scenario, I'm trying to work through what that SIG would look like though. Like, so we are, we have a SIG service catalog that only owns an incubator repo. So it's kind of a weird chicken egg thing where like other things wouldn't have produced a SIG necessarily to incubate, but let's say a new SIG is formed, they get a SIG org right away and then in this case catalog would have gone there you could then, argue that that was that that sig was too narrowly scoped i, I was yeah. going to just say that you could also say that it could be a sub project of sig apps or something like that okay i'm going to yeah, and i don't that. know what that means to ever say i i, I still am cautious on this idea of graduating to core it feels like well, that like a I think it, I think it depends, right? 
I think it really depends, I guess. I think that there are going to be some tools that go GA out of their SIG space. Service catalog, maybe it's specific enough and not core enough and an add-on enough that it stays in SIG, that it GAs out of there. But I think you have to get permission for that exception, that the expectation should be you graduate to core. And if you need to take it, all right, Joe's waking. Yeah, th this is the thing that like, like I think saying that you have to graduate to core to go GA, that's going to create a lot of pressure on stuff. I think if instead we say, if you want to be GA and be part of the release bundle, you must be part of core. But then they're, but having SIGs to find their own release bundles that actually ship out of band make a ton of sense, right? Sure, that's fine. I think there is this question of like, and you know, I, I look at something like Helm, right? It's like Helm is currently a graduated project. It has its own release time. Like COPS is in the same case. It has its own release timeline. It has its own release bundle. It has its own mechanisms, right? It's a completely sort of parallel project. Like, should that be part of the, the Kubernetes SIG apps for, for, for Helm, for example, and have it be GA and actually be Helm out of there, right? I mean, that doesn't seem insane to me. No, that seems totally fine, too. I, I think that, and maybe we make a distinction between, like, SIG GA versus Kubernetes GA, and Kubernetes GA means SIG architecture has to say it's GA, even, like, just sort of a criteria. It doesn't mean that you move. It just means that someone else took a look at what you said was GA and we have some degree of consistency across the project. Well, there's also be part of the release process would incorporate some level of vetting with the binary bits for it. I actually think that we will have a release bundle. If you're in the release bundle, that's a big deal. Yeah, I mean, and, and I think that that's, and I don't even know that we necessarily want to, yeah, I, I, th I think that, 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 that having things in core be the only things that are in the, in the, the mainline release bundle makes a ton of sense. Are, are we in enough agreement as I watch Joe sort of cough himself to death? Um, are we in enough agreement around this to say like, hey, let's have a nice, are we in enough agreement about this to ship it externally? I mean, we've sort of shipped it externally anyway, but like, and get the comments and, and say we're going to go discuss this and narrow it down externally. I think, I think it needs to be wordsmith properly because I think you're going to get death by a thousand needles. Uh, okay. Any, any specific comments or? The, yeah. the language you mean maybe like a fact, like a fact, like what, like what we just did? Just, like, just like exactly the question and answer session that we just did, I think with, you know, Aaron's outlining of different user stories and what that actually means would be super helpful to alleviate what will essentially be a bunch of people are going to take umbrage with some of the ideas here that's going to happen. That's inevitable. Right? But at least we have the user stories thought out enough that, you know, you, there's a path for A or B or C. Yeah, that sounds good to me. I mean, my main thing was just, yeah, answer answer some of the common questions and show the path to roll out. Discussion. Yeah, I think also um, the committee members that aren't here would, would be great. This is a big thing. Have some eyes on that. The only um, only comments I put in the doc that I hadn't seen addressed from then, or maybe I haven't reread it properly, uh, end of life stuff. Um, are we just saying like it's sort of up to a SIG to say whether or not they've got too much stale stuff and, and whether or not to kick stuff out of their work? Yeah, I didn't really want to set a fixed bar for that kind of stuff. Um, I think that having some degree of life cycle-ish stuff to it, like the GA core bundle thing is, is good, but I feel like EOL stuff is, I mean, I just don't care. And I don't think anybody else does either. Like, I think if you, if you associate, if it's associated, then clearly you don't care. If it's SIG, then clearly the SIG gets to decide how serious or not they are. If it's core, then architecture should decide. Sounds good. Okay, um, so sounds like we need another rev on the docs. I recorded some of the open questions from this discussion in the notes, Brendan. Um, 
All right. Thanks. I'll rev, I'll rev tonight, tomorrow, or something like that, and get yeah. another draft by the end of the week. Yeah. Um, as I didn't really speak much, but as the person who uh, helped to kick off the incubator, I think this proposal makes a lot of sense and solves the issues of um, I want to create a repo. How do I do that? Um, and have some path to Kubernetes. Uh, all right. Five minutes left. Any last business? What do we have to finish off for this next sprint? So, so uh, do you want to give a quick update of the survey and the discussion that we had, that you, you and me and Michelle had, real quick? What was that? Um, so, so Phil and, and Michelle and I, I met and uh, to talk about, um, and I can pull up the notes, but uh, to talk about sort of what is the interfaces between SIGs and sort of the rest of the project and what are the rights and responsibilities and expectations out of that. And I think one of the, the core things there is a recognition that there is no one size fits all solution here and that there's different modes that different SIGs operate in. And so before we make any sort of decision there, we wanted to um, try and, and quantify as much as possible how different SIGs operate. And so, so uh, Phil was putting together a, a survey um, that he was going to send out to SIG leads to actually collect some of that information. Uh, so that's kind of where we're at with that. I don't think we have time to dig into the, into the contents of that, though. Is there a link or something? Let me see if yeah. I can. Okay, maybe you can email that out to the stream list. I, I don't remember seeing that, so. Here's the. You also added on the notes. Okay. Did, you, did you add it to the notes? I just found it here. Uh, not yet. Would you, would you go ahead and do that? Yeah. Okay. Um, thanks. And the <coughs> intention here is to email this out to the entire wide community. Um, I think I think the intention was to sig leads here. Okay. Okay. The thought um, being there that some of the answers, most of the answers are like short or long text, and so getting like a hundred responses would be a lot harder. Got it. And then. Are there things that we hope, like is there a list of things we hope to learn or decisions we want to make post the survey? Just trying to play out the next step. So in my mind, I think what we'd want out of this, I'm trying to remember, I can't find my notes right now. I should have had those up there. Um, we want to know what are the roles that we expect each SIG to be able to fill? Um, and so they need to name names and some person can actually fill multiple roles, but we want to make sure that we get those right roles. Uh, name uh, and so part of the SIGs interface to the rest of the world is being able to name these people um, and then have uh, we wanted SIGs to have a documented fair way of, of uh, picking those roles um, and then we wanted to uh, have a set of sort of starting documents for governance of SIGs that people that SIGs can ad uh, adopt and and find something that's going to be easy for folks to to take and, and customize if they absolutely need to. I Not think that was, if there's anything I'm forgetting, Phil? Yeah, uh, that sounds right. I think maybe the other things were, like from a higher level, we want to provide a baseline template of organizational structure that six can use if they don't have sufficient structure right now. A couple of the things we're targeting were like how decisions are made within the SIG, both like technical decisions and process related decisions and how like conflicts are resolved, how decisions are escalated, that sort of thing. And so from the survey, hopefully we'll figure out what people are doing today. If anyone has stuff that they like that works, um, we can maybe cannibalize that. Got it. So it's, it's sourcing ideas for the eventual solution. Yeah. And I think, I think the idea is that SIGs can customize this, but we also want to at least require SIGs to have something written down about how this stuff works in their particular sub-community. Okay. okay. All right. One minute. Anyone got a joke? All right. <laughs> I think we're good. Hey, hey, hey. Brandon, is there, is there a baby yet? No baby. No baby. Still on baby watch. When, Thanks when, for asking. When is baby? 
Uh, January 7th is the due date. So we'll see. Oh, man. Take pictures. <laughs> All right. Will do. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Take care. Bye. Happy New Year.